that little bar, Patty Newman's. And Jerry Price stops there every evening on his way home from work. He's not looking for anything special in the way of atmosphere, adventure, companionship. And he has no intention of getting drunk. Just a couple of beers, perhaps, to bridge a busy day, to ease the fatigue, the strain on his nerves. In the comfortable half-light of Patty Noonan's, the world outside becomes vague, distant. Especially when old man O'Rourke is holding forth. And he lay there, his head against the barricade, and the blood from him falling soft upon the pavements. I looked in his face, and I could see his death was upon him. Tis a bitter thing, I said, to die at seventeen. And for a moment his darkening eyes held mine. And with his last strength he said, "'Tis a sweet thing to die for Ireland." Sweet indeed, Mr. O'Rourke. Any calls for one on the house? I thank you, Paddy Noon. Ah, I see, uh, Jerry Price. Excuse me. Good evening, Jerry. Hi. I didn't notice you come in. Well, when old man O'Rourke's in form, you don't see anybody, Paddy. The old man there, he carries his war. I know I carry mine. You ever think of yours, Jerry? No, no, never. Never? No. Nope. The day I came home from Vietnam, I put away the uniform. I also put away everything that went with it. The army, the war, like a snake sheds his skin. Now the past is gone, Patty. It's dead, so you forget it. You go on to other things. Hey! What's everybody drinking? This round's on me. Set him up, Patty. Mr. Edward Clark himself. <laughs> and what's the occasion? Hey, I got a little announcement. Guess what the old lady tells me this morning. <laughs> Number 10 is on its way. Oh, that event around must be on the house, Mr. Clark. Oh, just a quick one, Patty. Hey, I got the truck outside. What are you hoping for this time, Ed, boy or girl? I see. What do I got now? Hey, four boys and five... No. No, no, I, I got five boys and four... Ah, who can keep them straight? All I know is I'm always tripping over somebody. Yeah. Ten kids in twelve years. Well, you can't tell me it isn't exciting to hear there's going to be a new baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know it's going to be a kid who'll wet its pants and keep me up half the night. It's another mouth I got to feed. Yeah, well, guys, I got to ride. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, Penny, it's funny. People who don't want kids, can't stand kids, can't afford them, can't raise them, they can't help getting kids. Whereas, I don't know, <clears throat> Because there just isn't any justice in this world. Well, there may be no justice, Jerry, but there's always hope. How long have you been married? Hmm? Right after I got out of the army, it'll be uh, nine years. The fellow used to come in here, and they were married 15 years before they had their first. <laughs> Am I really out of the army nine years? Tell me, Patty, you're an old philosopher. Where does it go, huh? Down the hatch and try another. Yeah, don't mind if I do. Oh, wait on the paying customer first. Where? The fellow standing at the end of the bar. What are you saying, Jerry? There's nobody standing at the end of the In the brown hat and the lean coat. Now, Jerry, what are you saying? Come home. That's Paul. Tell me, what's the matter, Jerry? Paul. Jerry, listen to me. There's no Paul. Paul. Hey, he was just standing here. Where, where'd he go? Where is he? Jerry, where is who? Are you all right, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. But I, I saw him. Who? Oh, uh, the guy I was in the army with. Uh, the two of you, were you close? He was my buddy. Well, when was the last time you saw him in, in person? The night he was killed. Have you, have you ever seen him again? Like you thought you did just now? No. No, this is the first time. Well, maybe you need a rest, Jerry. Patty, why now? Why tonight after all these years? Well, you say you saw him last the night he died in battle. Well, the sight of him dead must have stayed with you always. Yeah, that's not how I just saw him, Patty. He wasn't in uniform. He was in civilian clothes. You might have pictured him as he looked at a happier time. I never saw him in civilian clothes. We met in the army. And, Patty, I... I didn't see him as he was then. We were both kids, about 20... I saw him the way he'd look today, about 30. And his face was more mature. Jerry, are you sure he's dead? He is dead, Patty. I just saw him. 
I know I saw. Jerry, it's after midnight. No, I'm uh, not finished, honey. I uh, have to clean up these reports, Marge. Honey, a new rule has just been passed in this house. All paperwork shall be done in the daytime. Marge, I have to call on customers. Be reasonable, huh? Am I the kind of wife who makes idle criticism? No, indeed. Constructive suggestions, that's my motto. Northeast distributors can solve all your paperwork problems by hiring a girl. Honey, I'm lucky to have the job. No, Jerry. You're not lucky. They're lucky. Well, everybody knows you're a terrific salesman. Well, you could get another job tomorrow. More money, less headache. Honey, I couldn't walk out on Joe Keller. Why not? Well, I'll never forget what that man did for me. I came home from the Army, a kid with no experience. I needed a job. He took a chance with me. Now he needs me. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm just worried about you, Jerry. You look so tired all the time. No, I'm in great shape. Will you go see Doc Steiner? I did, today. Oh, well, it's about time. You needed a checkup. Well, I, uh... I didn't just go for the checkup, honey. I, uh... I went for the, uh, for the other thing. Jerry... Well, he said... Some people, men... Well, they're okay in every way, but it just doesn't work out for them. Jerry, it's all right. No, 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 honey. It's all my fault. Oh, honey. It's... Well, it's just unlikely there can ever be any kids... He said unlikely. What he meant was impossible. We've got each other. Yeah. If only you didn't want a child so badly. Now we'll definitely think about adopting. Okay? Yeah, okay. Sometimes that works out even better. Come on, honey. Let, let me see you smile. <laughs> Marge, Marge, Marge. I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> oh, that makes us even... I don't know what I'd do without you. Come on, get to bed. Yeah, I'll, uh, just have a cigarette, huh? Well, I mean, why'd you turn on the music? To make sure you don't try to sneak in some work. I know you can't concentrate with the music going. I'll just be a couple of minutes, honey. Hear that password. Paul, is that you? Jerry. Hey, climb down the hole and make yourself at home. Man, I'm so beat I can't even remember the password. Huh? That's all right. I don't even know what it is. Yeah, I got a cigarette? What do they want back at the CP, Jerry? A patrol. You going? Yep. But you went out yesterday. Well, maybe I better write to my congressman, huh? I don't have any more cigarettes. Here, finish this one. Paul... Well, I don't know if I can go out again. We're being relieved tomorrow. We were promised a rest. I just don't know if I can go out again. But you ain't going out, Jerry. Didn't you hear? I'm going. Oh, no, no. I'll say you and I made a trip. No, Paul. I can't let some other guy but do... But I'm not some other guy. I'm your buddy. What's the matter, Jerry? You never did it for me. Jerry, I'm here with you, in your living room. No, you can't be here. I went out afterward. I found your body. I carried it back. Maybe it wasn't you. It was me. But you were dead. You were killed. Yes, Jerry. I was killed. Jerry, will you turn that radio off and come to bed? Marge, he's here. Who's here? Can't you see him? Jerry, I don't see anyone. Paul, why can't she see you? She will. They all will. When? Later. I have to go now, Jerry. No, no, Paul. Paul, tell her. Jerry. She'll think I'm crazy, Paul. Paul. He's gone, Marge. He's gone. Jerry. Honey, what, what's going on here? Marge, he, he, he was here. He was right Ooh. here. No, you got to believe that. I'm not drunk, and I'm not crazy. I, 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 I believe you. I believe you, Jerry. Now, here, uh, ju just sit down. Uh, don't do anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> Calling, but 
can a doctor help what ails Jerry? In a moment, we'll return to Jerry and Marge and uh, Paul when we listen to Act Two. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. And as you may imagine, I'm excited about this new adventure in modern radio, this new statement of radio's marvelous power to stir the imagination. Now, we're wondering about your reaction, about who you are and how you like what we're doing. So to encourage you to get in touch with us, we're holding a drawing for three weeks, 50 prizes a week, two AM FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. Just mail us your name and address, and you're eligible. Of course, we'd like knowing whether your glad radio drama is back, but name and address will do it. To Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. That's Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 119. Or for good everywhere, unless locally prohibited. And now, Act Two of The Bullet. Let us trace the path of the bullet. We have a worried Marge, a concerned Dr. Steiner, and a distracted Jerry. Tell me about this man, uh... Paul, you called him Jerry. I said we were buddies, Doctor. That tells it all. Jerry, please don't be so hostile. Dr. Steiner's only trying to help. You were buddies. You came back alive and he didn't. Yo. There's an extensive medical literature on the subject. Oh, I'm sure there is. Jerry. I'm not being hostile, Marge. I know I saw him. Of course you saw him. Well, finally. But that doesn't mean he was there. You see, Jerry, the death of a wartime comrade remains an eternal reproach. All who survive are sentenced forever to feelings of guilt. No, no, no. Doctor, the wars are fought by kids in foxholes. The literature is written by doctors and officers. That's hardly fair, Jerry. I'm the authority on war, Doctor, because I was a kid in a foxhole. And I don't feel guilty about... about my buddy. You don't? No. Tell me why. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Try me. All right. You see, there's a bullet. And it's designed especially for you. And if it's your bullet, it'll find you no matter where you are. You can't evade it, you can't avoid it. It was meant for you, it was meant to be. You and the bullet. Both of you were dust, originally. You were dust because the Bible says so. And the bullet was also just dust in the ground. Well, that bullet was mined and refined and cast into metal. It was shaped into a slug and joined with a shell. It was one of billions of bullets, but it was yours, all yours. And at the right time, at the right time, there'd be a tremendous explosion of gases in the narrow chamber. And the bullet would be torn loose from the shell case and spun around the grooves of a gun barrel and hurled through space. This is the bullet you don't hear. You don't hear it, Doctor. You don't hear it whine past your ear or ping off a rock or thwack against a tree. That's because it's your very own bullet. It's coming to meet you or you're going to meet it. It's been arranged. You see, it's an appointment that can never be broken. The dust that had become the bullet would encounter the dust that had become you. And after a while, after a while, both of you would become dust once again and, and return to the ground, your original home. Jerry, I know you're overworked, you're overwrought, you're overtired. I keep telling him to slow down. Okay, okay, I know I'm under a strain. I know I'm working too hard, but what can I do? Jerry, try to understand. Right now, you're having what is popularly known as a nervous breakdown. This alleged visitor from another world. I say he's an illusion. Oh. I say you have subconscious feelings about him which you're not aware of. And I say they burst through because of heavy pressure on the nervous system. Yeah, I know you'd say that. Prove me wrong. How? Go away. Get out from under. Rest a while. Relax. <laughs> a good spot. You want to stop here and try for some fish? Well, Marge, uh, I think I'd like to go back and play nine holes this afternoon. Great. I need more practice with my iron. Oh, uh, honey, honey. Besides, you have an appointment with, uh, uh, what's that name? Uh, Biscayne Appliances. 
See, Jerry, I wasn't sleeping when you called that number this morning. Oh, Marge, I've been good all month. I was just getting restless, that's all. Look, they're a big chain down here. If I can open them up, I'll justify the trip. Justify? To whom? Why, why do you have to justify anything? Isn't your health important enough? Honey, Joe Keller was very nice about it. Joe Keller had no choice. Marge. Honey, Steiner was right. I was beat. I, I don't know how I managed to drag myself along. So I did, I did the right thing. I chucked it all. Now I'm fit, see? I, I never felt better in my life, and I'm raring to go. Great. In a month or two, we may think about going back. I'm, I'm not used to being idle, mm, honey. Neither am I. But I am learning to love it. <laughs> oh, boys. Why didn't I meet you when I was young? <laughs> young? Jerry, you weren't even 21. No, I was already made when we met. I had already become what I was going to be. You know, I've got a certain amount of ability. Mm, a tremendous amount, Jerry. But I'm not confident, honey. I doubt myself. I, I guess I didn't have very much encouragement when I was a kid. You know, my brother was a great athlete. My sister was a great beauty. I, I was kind of clumsy and funny looking. Anyway, Frank and Alice were sent to college. When my turn came, the money had run out. Or maybe they thought I wasn't worth the effort. That's why I enlisted when I was 18. I had to get away from the house of my father. There was no place else to go. You never told me this, honey. I decided if I ever had a kid, I'd never make jokes at his expense or tear him down in any way. I know how these things cut inside where it doesn't show. I would do everything to build him up and give him confidence. I, I will never, never have any real confidence, Marge. Oh, yes, you will. No, no, no baby. You, you won't get it from a pep dog. I think we can go back home now, Marge. Mm. All right, on one condition. You just have to slow down. Mm -hmm. I promise. And honey, there's only one way you can really slow down. That's to get a partnership from Joe Kelly. Oh, Marge. Don't you deserve it? Of course it? I do. Well, we're, we're going to adopt a child. Which means I'll, I'll quit my job and you're not going to spend time on the road. That kid will need both of us, won't he? Yeah. Yes, I, he will. Then we need that partnership, don't we? <laughs> You look like a million bucks. Less two percent for cash, of course. Yeah, Joe. Oh, hold it. Oh. Ramona, no calls. I'm in a meeting. I can't be disturbed. Well, anyhow, Joe, hello. I want you to take it easy for a while, you hear? Yeah, I'm ready for action. Joe. Oh, you think you're ready. Now, listen. I know you had a lot of expenses. I want you to take this little check. It's only 500. I'm strapped for cash this way. I had to pop for a whole new computer setup. But anyway, I decided to increase your bonus to 5%. That'll amount to a pretty sweet raise, huh? Now, Joe... Don't, 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 don't thank me, kid. You're inside of it. we got to make sure you don't get sick again. Joe, I have to talk with you. Well, sure, kid. What about? Well, it's, uh, personal and important. Well, let me buy you lunch. Come on, Jimmy. What are we going to talk about? I'm fresh out of polite conversation. Joe. Joe, I want a partnership. No, you don't, Jerry. But Joe, no, 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 don't interrupt. You don't want one. You'd like one. Two different things. I don't nitpick, Joe. You'd like a partnership, which means it would be swell. Great if you had it. But want is something else. It means lack. It means need. I know you'd like to own a business, but you're not cut out to be an owner. Why? Because an owner is an officer. And in your heart, you'll always be an enlisted man. Tommy, could you ever fire a guy because you could get someone else cheaper? If an old customer, a good friend, was getting slow-paying bills, could you cut him off? Thousands of guys like you go bankrupt every year. You're nice, sweet, big-hearted. 
But you don't have the guts, business needs. Well, I'd like to remind you of the volume I sell. I know it to the penny, Jerry, and you're well paid for it. Well, I'm worth more now. You are. You got a sweet raise this morning. Joe, Joe, don't, don't think I'm not grateful. You gave me my first break. But I think I can do better elsewhere. Where? Anywhere. Consolidated. Freeman and Singer. Should I go down the list? Oh, they'd love to have you, Jerry. What do they pay? They handle the nationally advertised brands. What will you be there? Glorified order taken? They don't need your full selling ability, so they don't have to pay your full price for it. Sure, with me, you push out all the schlock. It's rough. But you get top dollar. There's 20 outfits like mine. They grab you tomorrow. But where's the improvement? They won't pay you more. At least here, you got nine years equity in a pension plan. You and me are used to each other. Sounds are really like it. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a father to you, Jerry. a fiasco, Patty, a fiasco. Well, how do I break it to March? Oh, what's it all about, Jerry? Well, at least I don't have to put up with that clock tonight. I think I'd punch him right in the mouth. We'll be the back of this wonderful company in the next two weeks. He's two on that trailer into the southwest. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> Patty. Patty, is someone standing behind me? No, Jerry. Well, will you tell me why? I'll tell you everything, Jerry. When? So, I think maybe tonight. Well, why do you keep popping in like this? I don't know, buddy. I can't control that. Yeah, but Paul. But Paul. Paul. Patty, don't you see anyone? No, Jerry. Hey, you didn't hear anyone talking to me either. No. Patty, Patty, do you think I'm crazy? Well, maybe you should see a doctor. I saw a doctor. Well, how about one of them uh, psychiatrist fellas? I never even told my wife. I did see a psychiatrist. But after a while, I figured why pay him 50 bucks an hour when I can come in here and talk to you for nothing? Well, there must be more to them fellas than that. I'm sure. He said that the roots of my problem go back to my unhappy childhood. But, Patty, I have a brother, Frank, who feels terribly insecure. He goes to a psychiatrist, too. Why? He had a happy childhood. Well, put it this way. If you see someone, and I don't, the flaw can be in me and not in you. Drink? No. No. I better go home and face the music. Someplace and talk. Where? Let's go to the parking lot. Sit in your car. It's cold. That won't bother you, will it? Not yet. Turn the heater on for yourself. When will everyone else be able to see you, Paul? In two weeks. That's great. No. It ain't. Why not? Because you will be dead. Because you will be dead. Cold words from a warm friend. The chill inside the car becomes intense. But Jerry knows there's no point in turning on the heater. We'll rejoin these two friends when I return shortly with Act Three. seen each other in almost nine years. Jerry Price, who is alive, and Paul Gardner, who is dead. The heater in this car doesn't do much good. You're shivering. Why am I going to be dead, Paul? Remember the night I went out on the patrol? Yeah, I'll remember that night as long as I live. I completed my job. I was headed back. And then I felt something smash against my head. And I knew. I knew I just met the bullet. 
You know, the bullet we used to talk about? <laughs> I bet you don't remember. Oh, I remember, I remember. I felt it slam into me. And then... I didn't know anything anymore. Yeah, well, when the guys told me, I went out to get you, Paul. Yeah, I might have known you would. One minute, I was moving through a rice paddy. And the next minute, I'm, I'm sitting in an office. And I knew a lot of time had gone by. Don't, don't ask me how. I, I knew, that's all. A man was talking to me. What a... What kind of man? You know the type that's a clerk in the government or a big corporation, fussy, self-important. Everything's got to be in the right place. He doesn't even look at me. He's got a piece of paper. He says, Paul Gardner, you're going back. You should not have died that night. The computation was for you to survive. The plan was for you to marry a girl named Marjorie Stone. I married Marjorie Stone. Yeah. I told the guy. I want no part of it. And he gives me a look, this clerk does. Like he couldn't care less about me or you or anybody else. And he says, come with me. He leads me to a door. It opens. And all I can hear is a hum and a click. And all I can see is a computer. I mean, there's no end to the thing. That's all you can see is computer. And he says, there it is, friend. City Hall. Go fight it. <laughs> By this time, I'm shaking. That machine scared the pants off me. You couldn't see the top nor the bottom of it. There was no end to it. Just machine, wherever the eye could see. Well, uh, then what happened? This clerk, he tells me there's a plan. A capital P plan. It calls for me to come home. Not you. Yeah, well, may maybe that's fair, Paul. You, you were always the better man. Now, you got more on the ball. You never got a break, that's all. I had a chance to go to school, become somebody. I could have gone into the old man's business, become the biggest hardware dealer in Atlanta. You and me, we both run away to join the army. You because you had nothing, me because I had everything. But why are you coming back? Because Marge and I are supposed to have a boy. A certain kind of a boy. He'll grow up, I don't know, discover something, create something, or be somebody the world needs real bad they wouldn't tell me what anyhow 40 50 years from now he has to be here and of all the millions of men and women he could only be born to me and marge where when uh, am i leaving i told you in two weeks how nine o'clock at night a trailer truck will go past patty noonan's saloon just as you're crossing the street. But why does it have to be like that? Because you don't know how careful these things are figured. You could get killed a million ways. But the plan calls for a truck driven by a guy named Ed Clark. Oh, yeah, I know Ed Clark. He doesn't have a good record. So it'll be easy to prove he's a careless driver. He works for a big outfit, so Marge will have a good settlement. But why? I still don't She'll understand. She'll need the money. You see, I won't be a good father. Not as good as you, for sure. Oh, I'll love the kid. I'll love Marge, but... I won't be there a lot. You know me. I have to keep moving. But if you know how important it is for the kid... I won't know. Once I'm alive, I won't remember any of this. Now, you say it's all figured out. Maybe not. The human element. How, how can the machine predict Marge would go for you, huh? <laughs> With all due respect, Jerry... Did I ever have any trouble landing any dame I had my sights on? Well, with all due respect, I can't see Marge falling for your line of chatter. She will, Jerry. I'll be there when she's having a bad time. She'll be all alone. She'll need somebody. Things will take their natural course. Sure, she'll see through my line, but after a while she'll get to like it. I'm different. You're quiet. I raise hell. You let things... Eat at your inside, not me. I pop off. Maybe my way's no better in the long run. And she's married to you, and she loves you. But deep in her heart, she loves my way better. She'll fall in love with me. Jerry, you have to believe I don't want to do this, but it was your bullet. 
not mine. Jamie? Hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, a guy down state wants to cancel a carload of refrigerators, so I'm uh, figuring an approach. Didn't we agree? No more work at home. Well, honey, this is just uh, thinking. Did you talk to Joe Carroll about the partnership? Yeah. And? He said no. Did you give him notice? No, he gave me a raise. Oh. Okay. Marge. Why don't you mix us a drink? Honey, aren't you going to say anything? Mm Mm-hmm. Don't put in too much ice. Marge, please, you don't understand. I understand. I married a certain kind of man. And you stuck with him? No. I'll stick by him. Because I love him. Would you have wanted a guy who'd barge into Joe Keller's office and say, Joe, either give me half the joint or I'll open up across the street and run you out of business? Oh, come on, Answer me, Marge. I have to know. Well, maybe I did. Why didn't you marry him? He never showed up. So you settled for me. That's what's known as falling in love. Come on, honey, take me to the movies. No, no, I I don't want to take you to the movies. Let's go downtown and see a play. But that's a lot of money. Are you going to worry about money? And look, this weekend, would you like to fly out to, uh, say, Snow Valley and see? Yeah, or how about Las Vegas, huh? Jerry, what's gotten into you? I mean, we're going to have two weeks of the most fantastic... Why, why two weeks? Oh, what, what's so special? You? Me? I just want to spend the rest of my life having a ball with you. <laughs> Stranger. I, I haven't seen you. Hey, it must be weeks. Where have you been? Oh, uh, giving Marge a good time. Well, I must say, it's done wonders for you. You look so calm. Do I? Do you ever see the little guy who wasn't there? Uh, no. Well, that's good. Let's drink to it. Uh, Jerry, if I'm not being forward, who did he want from you? He wouldn't believe it, Patty. Do you believe it? Well, I, uh... Just dropped in to say hello, Patty, and goodbye. Jerry. Yeah? Something's the matter with you. Well, I, uh... I understand Ed Clark is due back here tonight. I don't want to run into him. I just don't want to talk to him. Well, if that's how you feel, I'll buy him from the joint. Now, Jerry, something's wrong with you. Oh, no, no, nothing, Patty. Now, look, I'm an old soldier, Jerry. I can tell. No, it's really nothing. Really, is it? No, Jerry, you got a look on your face. What kind of look? I've seen it before in the war. I've seen it on men who go out on the impossible mission. The look of men who know they're not coming back. The resigned look. What are you resigned to, Jerry? You have a vivid imagination. I have an imagination. Jerry, whatever it is, don't be resigned to it. Fight it. You can't fight city. I knew it. You're in a fight, Jerry. Well, you can fight anybody. You're an ex-combat soldier, and you weren't afraid of anything. When you were out there, you faced up to death, hunger, despair. What happened to you, Jerry? Where did you lose it? Face up to it now. Whoever he is, spit in his eye. Patty, I can't do anything. Jerry, I'm going to throw you out of here for your own good. Now leave, leave town. Go far away for a while. Fight it, Jerry, fight it. Patty, Patty, wherever I go. Listen to old Patty, just take off. Don't you see there's a plan? Who cares? Put up a fight. Why are you so upset, Patty, huh? I don't know. But listen to me. Fight, now. Now get out of here. I decided to fight it. Good boy, Jerry. You know, Patty, there's something about your place. I don't know how to say it, but I feel stronger, better, away from it. Well, I don't mind. So I'm going to fight. What have I got to lose, huh? Why, why should I do what he tells me? Why should I believe him? I don't know what it is, but I agree. I'll see you around, Patty. Universal Airlines, flight number three for Los Angeles and Mexico City, now boarding at gate 17. Who are you calling, Jerry? Marge, I have to tell you. Jerry, don't do it this way. There'll be a hundred 
other people on that plane. Do it the way it has to be done. Paul, I have to Do fight you. Why? Because it isn't fair. Was it fair for me to stop your bullet? Come on, Jerry. Ed Clark will be tuned by Patty's in less than an hour. Paul, I, I don't know if I have to do it. I'll help you, buddy. I'll help you. Come on. Hello? hope it wasn't out of turn, Mrs. Price. It's about Jerry. What about Jerry? He's sitting back there in the booth. Now, wait. Don't go to him yet. He's in trouble. Why, well, it can't be. We've had such a glorious two weeks. He's in trouble. What kind of trouble? I don't know. We have to help him somehow. Is it that buddy? I think so. Well, the time has come to lay that nonsense to rest once and for all. And I'm going to... That won't work. Agree with him. Show him anything he wants is okay with you. Don't fight him. Or we can give him his love. Hi, honey. Hi. Buy me a drink? Oh, sure. You know, I, I never knew you had those little gold highlights in your hair. Oh, I'm using a different bottle this week. I love you. I love you, too. And I want you to be with me always. Come on, Jerry. Let's start. No, not yet. Are you talking to me? The plan calls for it. How do I know there is a plan? Ask anybody. Ask Marge. Jerry, what are you talking about? Marge. Marge, do you believe there's a plan that determines the actions of everybody in the whole world? No. You sure? I'm sure. Well, then how do you think things work out? Well, every which way. Come on, Jerry. It's time. No, no, I won't go. Where won't you go? Then, Marge, as far as you're concerned, there isn't any plan. Oh, well, well, I, well, what do you think, Jerry? Well, that's not important. What do you think? Well, uh, yes. Yes, there is a plan. I, I can prove it. You can? Yes, but you started me thinking there has to be a plan. Otherwise, you and, and I, we just never would have met. Remember that day? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you were taking cash at Ryman's drugstore. That's the only reason I walked in there. <sighs> well, I'd already given notice I was going to leave. And then you walked in and asked Doc if you could open a charge. Then and there, I decided to stay. And where? Where were you going? Oh, away. Pull up stakes. Why? Well, my folks were gone. My friends were married. The neighborhood had changed. The girl I went to school with had a father, a construction engineer. He'd been transferred. Well, she took a job in his new office, and she wrote and said she found a nice crowd. They needed secretaries down there. She could fix it up. Well, why not? I was set to go. But it was not to be. You came wandering into Ryman's. Obviously, there's a master plan that rules our lives. And, and where was this? wonderful place you almost went to. Atlanta. Atlanta? <laughs> What's so remarkable about that, Jerry? It, it was definite you were going. Oh, well, sure. And only because I... Only because you met me. Only because I met you. And otherwise, I'd have gone to Atlanta and married a southern millionaire. But evidently, something had been planned for me. Aren't you flattered? I met you. And it changed my whole life. Are you ready to go now, Jerry? George, will you come with me? Yes, Jerry. Where do you want to go? Why, well, I, I have to do something. I'll come with you. No, no, wait here, darling. Please. It's time, buddy. Just like going out on a patrol. Jerry, where are you going? That's all right, Patty. It's all right. I didn't want this, buddy. I know, I know. I don't want you to take my bullet either. Goodbye, Jerry. Yeah, goodbye, Paul. Take care of her for me, huh? You know I will. I've got her. But bring her into that bar where it's warm. We're a little 
stimulant. <laughs> it's all right. Everything will be all right. Everything will be, will be all right. So many people preface what they believe with, it is written. It is written in the stars. It is written on the wind. And for so many like Jerry, it is written on the bullet. I'll be back shortly. And now another tale of the ball and chain. At Kellogg's Special K presents... Presents Last Tango in Pittsburgh. There I was at Raoul's All Right Tango Lounge. My little orchid, will you tango with me? It was Raoul. Oh, you're a splendid dancer. <laughs> but what was that? I was what? That sound effect. Oh, I'm a few pounds overweight. And this ball and chain points out how my extra weight can get in the way. I'm pointing you back to your chair. Oh. Our heroine decided to lose that extra weight. She exercised and ate smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. A bowl of special K, skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and 100% delicious. After a while, she was rid of the ball and chain and back at Raoul's. Well, darling, you're looking fantastic. What a happy ending. What ending? We're just getting started. Now, hmm? get lost. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K Breakfast. And that's another tale of the ball and chain. told me he wasn't worried about the bullet that had his name on it. What really bothered him was the bullet marked to whom it may concern. Our concern is mystery, excitement, suspense, thrills, and chills. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Jester, Martin Newman, Ralph Bell, Leon Janney, and Danny Ako. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. Now, a preview of our next tale. The only way to learn how to swim is to jump in the water, right? Well, that's what you need, Julia. I simply can't make you understand, can well, I? Well, maybe I can make you understand. Ah, forget it. You want to get that dinner ready? I'm hungry. Yes, yes, I'm going now. Uh, look, uh, why don't you change first? Change? Yeah, yeah, your clothes. Get more comfortable. Yes, I think I'd like to do that, George. I, I won't be long. Take it easy. That's my surprise. That's it, too. Get him out of here. Please, George, take him away. It's only a dog, for Pete's sake. He's not going to hurt you. Get it out. George, please. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.